Good morning, and it's wonderful to be able to worship together. And uh, this morning is a Gospel Sunday, and it means I will use simpler languages. I try to avoid big words in the Bible and uh, try to make it clearer for anyone who may not be familiar with the Bible. Now, I have chosen a simple question, which is um, taken from the passage we have read. It's a second passage. Uh, it's a question, who can be saved? Who can be saved? Now, I think firstly, when people hear this question, uh, the first thing that came to my mind is, well, I'm not in danger. I'm all right. What are you talking about? So firstly, when the Bible says save or salvation, it's referring to something different to what we consider as being saved. So we're going to look at what is being saved meant. And then secondly, which is a very important question, what kind of people will God choose to save or for salvation? So let's first ask what is being saved means. Now, obviously, we are living uh, in a very stressful time and no one can guarantee our um, our safety uh, or or the, uh, the the moment the threat of being infected by the virus but i think in general when we think of being safe we are referring to our physical condition i'm all right i'm not in danger right or if i meet anything i can you know either look after myself so therefore i am not in danger or if i need help if for example if i'm not well i can find someone to help me someone to save me for example a few days ago when my car broke down then i need someone <laughs> to fix my car well fortunately you know <laughs> there are mechanics and uh, that we can call upon so in many ways we can either do things to ease our life or find someone to help us in times of need now the bible says being saved means different thing it means something that we cannot do for ourselves not even money can buy no one can come to our aid is regarding to being saved or by God, right? Or to receive eternal life or to be accepted by God in his kingdom. So if you look at the passage that we have put on the screen, you notice the word, the kingdom of God, is being associated with the question of being saved. Jesus looked round and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now earlier on in the same passage, we read last week, a young man came to ask Jesus of this important question. He said, what do I do? to inherit eternal life. So in, it is in the same passage that after he left, Jesus made a comment and said, this young rich ruler, he chose to walk away from Jesus. And instead of getting the eternal life, which he hoped to get to secure, he walked away empty-handed. So when Jesus said, look, it is 
hard for this rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Right? And then he repeated the same thing. And uh, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, then the disciples were amazed and asked this question, who then can be saved? Right? So, firstly, being saved or salvation in the Bible means God's rescue of us and receiving us into his kingdom. So entering the kingdom of God, to be accepted by God in his kingdom, and to inherit the life for the age to come. That's eternal life. Now, so this is a very important question. Who can be accepted by God? Now, in the Old Testament, there is no clear indication of individual being certain of salvation. God's people is pictured as collectively a group of people coming to God with a relationship. But there is still no certainty of a personal salvation. So much so that even People ask questions like, well, is Moses saved? Would he get salvation? Would he be given eternal life? Why do they ask this? Because when we read in the Old Testament, uh, he was not allowed to enter the promised land. He was taking God's people up to the border of Canaan. But because of his disobedience earlier on, God said, look, Moses, you are not allowed to go in, but you can have a look and see from afar the land that I have promised your ancestor, the land which your people will enter, but not you. Can you see? Even in the Old Testament, there is no guarantee, no clear indication that a person, as an individual, will secure eternal life or to be accepted by God in his kingdom. Such language are not being used in the Old Testament. And that's why the Jews are searching the scriptures. But to them, it's, it's the Old Testament that we have. They searched the scripture because they thought in them there is eternal life. And they want to be sure that they can secure or inherit eternal life. That's what the young man came to ask Jesus for. And we read that last week. Now, so we thank God that in the New Testament, when Jesus came, he has revealed God's plan and he has revealed the Father to us through his life. That's why he said to the people, if you see me, you see the Father. If you hear me, you hear the Father because I speak what I receive from the Father. Now, so what does Jesus say? about eternal life. And that's why the young man, he was smart. He came to ask Jesus this important question. What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? So let's ask this important question. So what kind of people will God choose to save? If even Moses is not allowed to enter the promised land. Well, who is good enough to be saved? Who is good enough to be received by God? Can you see? 
Now, so let's leave the question of Moses aside for for now, and uh, and uh, in the New Testament, make, Jesus makes it very clear: there is eternal life, there is kingdom of God, and to secure this, you must follow Him, and that's the the the, the, the offer given by Jesus to that young rich man and we read about that last week but today let's consider now it's a person who lived a good and a moral life good enough to be saved now it's a good question isn't it and um, By living a good life is not good enough, then why bother? Right? There are pe people who ask, well, you may as well just live a life that you choose, forget about the moral issue, you just please yourself, and uh, at the end of it, there's no guarantee to be saved, so why bother? And uh, to the to the young man who asked this question last week, well, he said, look, I have lived an upright life. I am not only, you know, living a good life, I'm living a religious life. You know, he paid attention to God's word and he lived by God's standard. And uh, so a good question, a good upright person, not necessarily a religious person, but if I add on good and upright living plus religious living, then would I be safe? It's a good question. Now to this, Jesus said, look, unfortunately, unfortunately to that young man who was a good man, he was a religious man. He keeps God's law. I mean, it's pretty amazing. He said, look, God says, you shall not uh, commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. He kept all this. Right? And obviously, he takes God's word seriously. But yet, Jesus said, how hard it is for such a person to enter the kingdom of God. In the Bible, in verse 24 and verse 25, Jesus actually said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, what does Jesus mean by that? Now, the camel is the largest animal in the Middle East, and uh, the eye of a needle is the smallest, tiniest open that you can find. Now, how could such an enormous animal like a camel going through the eye of a needle is virtually impossible? It's just like, you know, uh, 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 Finding a needle in the ocean. It is just simply impossible. So, are the rich being singled out for not being fit for God's kingdom? Have Jesus got anything against rich people? Now, it is not so. Because to that young man, that was something that held him back. He was not as we heard last week, he was not willing to let go of his personal security to trust that Jesus is good enough for him to follow. So for, for ourselves, it may be something other than wealth. It may be something that is precious to ourselves that we are not willing to give up. So, Jesus said, look, 
there is no one who can come to God through our own effort. If by being good, by being religious, if we think that by themselves, then we can enter the kingdom of God, or we can be received by God, then we are wrong. Because Jesus said, look, it is not possible by man. And he makes it very clear uh, in the scripture, uh, in chapter 10, when he, when he answered the question, uh, answer uh, the disciples' questions, he said, with man, that is impossible. By living a good, a righteous, a religious life, if you think that by that, you know, we will be able to receive by God, that is not possible. Now, that is not to say that God doesn't like us to live a good life. God doesn't care that we live an upright or a religious life, a life that fear Him. No. On the contrary, God is holy. God is light. In Him there is no darkness. So it is therefore wrong to assume that, look, it doesn't matter whether we live a good life or not. The Bible actually makes it very clear, right? God watches over the righteous, right? And, uh, and God takes delight when we live an upright life. And, and as Christians, all the more we need to live an, a life which reflects God's holiness, which reflects God's love and God's nature. But if we think that by these, our good conduct, by our good behavior, by our religious duties, if we are thinking that these are good enough for God, then we are wrong. And that's why Jesus said, look, with men to receive the kingdom of God by our own effort to receive eternal life that is not possible even if we, if we can keep or, or even if we keep God's law and we know that we can't right when we say we are a good person we are using it comparatively when we say that look, I have done no wrong we are thinking of well, I have not um, committed anything criminal. I've not broken the civil law. But in the eyes of God, even our thought, even our desire is to be examined. God said, yes, you do not steal. Yes, good if you do not commit adultery. But if it is in your mind, if it is in your desire <coughs> that you lust after another person, then you have committed adultery even in your heart, in your mind. It is not acceptable in God's sight. So therefore, a good question. If it is impossible by living a good life to receive God's salvation, then who can be saved? And that's why the, the um, disciple asked this simple question. Look, if this good young man who kept God's law, if he cannot be saved, who can be saved? So Jesus did not give a clear answer in that passage. But in the next slide, I think you will get the answer. Jesus said, look, we may be good, we may be righteous, we may be religious in the eyes of others. But in the eyes of God, we are all sick. We are all 
sinners. And he said in Mark chapter 2, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've come to call the righteous, but, sorry, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, sometimes when people misunderstand the gospel and simply say, look, how come God seems to favor the sick and seems to show people uh, uh, so favoritism to those who are bad, who are sinners? No. God is saying, look, in his eyes, our so-called good is simply not good enough. And um, when we stand before God, compared ourselves against God's holiness, His goodness, when we expose ourselves in His light, are you sure there is no darkness in us? Are you sure there's no hidden sin? And there's a verse in the Bible in the Old Testament through the prophet Isaiah. We read, we are all in fact, we, we are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. It simply means we may be good and clean in front of others or through the eyes of others. But through God's lens, we are sick. We are dirty. We may put on the best dress, but our so-called good behavior in God's eyes are nothing but filthy rags. Now that is our condition. Spiritually, we are sick. By God's standard, we are sinners. And Jesus said in this simple uh, statement, it is not the healthy who needs a doctor, but the sick. What does it mean? It is a simple fact, isn't it? If we are not well, then we go and find a doctor for, uh, for advice and for a cure. If we think that we are well, then we don't need a doctor. Now, Jesus is saying sim simply, if we feel that, if we think that we are good enough, then God is of no use to us, is he? God, as it were, will become just the icing on the cake. Unfortunately, this is what some people regard God as, something extra something uh, something that that will just enhance my life but i can be still live a good life without god in my life this is really really sad isn't it our true condition in the sight of god is we are sick you know what a sick person means if he or she is sick and keeps on in this condition, he or she will suffer and die. And that is our true condition before God. Spiritually, we are all sick. We are good in the eyes of others or in the eyes of ourselves, but in the eyes of God, we are sinners. And if we are sick physically, we go and find a doctor. If we are sick spiritually, who do we go to? We go to God. And that's why God said, look, I am like the good doctor, right? And I'm available 
but you need to come and find me. It's just like any good doctor, whether you are a rich person or a poor person, whether you are a good person or a bad person, if you need a doctor, if he's a good doctor, he will see to you and he will help you and he will prescribe med medication and help you to recover. Now, in the same way, if we do not go to God for our spiritual condition, how can God help us? And that's why Jesus said, look, if you think that you are good enough, if you think that you are not sick, then I have no use for you. But if you come, if you acknowledge that you are sick, that you are physically, not just physically, but spiritually sick as a sinner, if you are willing to put down your pride and ask God for help, and God said, whether you are good or bad, whether you're religious, then I am here for you. This is what Jesus means. I have come for those who recognize that they are sick spiritually. I have come for not those who think that they are good enough, but for those who think that they are not good enough for God, that they are sinners. And they need God's mercy. And when we come humbly before God, to acknowledge that we are but sinners and we need God's mercy. And we ask for forgiveness and there is forgiveness and there will be acceptance. And there is something that we can hold on for certainty. As I said earlier on, People in the Old Testament, like Moses, they have no personal assurance of the certainty of eternal life, do they? But we thank God that now, after Jesus has come, he has shown it clearly that there is eternal life in him. There is such a certainty like entering into the kingdom of God. There is a certainty of being saved. And that's why Jesus said, look, with man, this is not possible, but not with God. With God, all things are possible. In other words, salvation only comes through God himself. And how do we know? Jesus said, if you know me, then you know the Father. I tell you the truth. I give you what I receive from the Father. So therefore, Jesus can make this promise and said, look, truly I tell you, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age homes brothers sisters mothers children and fields along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life notice how he brings back the whole question from the young man, this question of eternal life, the question of being saved, with God that is, that is possible. So Jesus said, look, if you are willing to believe that I am the Son of God, that I have come not to condemn, but to save, and Jesus has demonstrated that he died on the cross for our sin. And in him there is eternal life. And Jesus said, if you take my word, if you believe 
in me. If you accept that I am the Son of God and follow me and trust your life in me, put down all those others who are precious but not, not as precious as eternal life, not as precious as Jesus himself. And that's why in the previous passage we read, Jesus said, look, it's better to do without one eye than not entering the kingdom of God. It's better to go without something that you feel you cannot do without rather than losing your eternal life. So that's the point. And Jesus said, look, if you are willing to accept my word and follow me, and what did, what did Jesus say? You will be rewarded 100 times in this present age. So God doesn't owe us anything. We think that we give up so much for God. God is saying, look, I am no man's debtor. I will repay you in this present age and in the age to come, eternal life. Right? And that's exactly what he said to that young man who asked Jesus the question, what do I need to do for eternal life? Jesus said, look, if you leave what you treasure now and then you give your riches away to the poor and follow me you'll build treasures in heaven and you have eternal life so only acceptance of Jesus asking for his cleansing and follow him such a sinner such a sick person will be saved. So to the disciples who ask this question, who can be saved? Jesus said, clearly, anyone, anyone, whether you are good, bad, whether you're religious or not, if you are willing to come to Jesus for salvation, if you are willing to acknowledge that we are sick and a sinner before God and ask for mercy, then Jesus will show us his mercy and he will receive us. So let's conclude with the last slide. And Jesus made this very clear. He said, my sheep listen to my voice and I know them and they will follow me. That speaks of a very intimate relationship of following Jesus, isn't it? He's using the picture of sheep following a shepherd. And Jesus said, if you come to me, if you follow me, I will give you eternal life. And they shall never perish. This is what being saved is all about. Right? We will die physically, but through death. We enter life. There is no one who can take us away from the hand of Jesus. Now, isn't that wonderful? I just hope that whether you are a Christian or not a Christian, this is something you can take home with. What kind of people will God choose to save? Simply, we follow Jesus. Trust him as our Lord and Savior. And in him, there is eternal life. And no one, no one, nothing can take us away from him. Now, this is what being saved is all about. And we thank God that there is such a certainty today. Are you willing to respond to it? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you have come to show us eternal life in Jesus. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks that you died on the cross to pay for our sin. And Lord, we acknowledge before you 
that we are sick and we are sinners. And we pray, Lord, for your mercy. And we pray that, Lord, you help us. When we walk our own way, when we try to live lives without you, Lord, forgive us and cleanse us. And we want to follow you for the rest of our lives as your disciples, as your sheep, and to honor you as our Lord. This is our prayer. For we ask this in Jesus' name.